Um, <clears throat> here we are again, and at the final session of our two-day Loud About Food Conference, I can barely believe it. It's been, um, we've had so many wonderful speakers. Um, we've had such great conversation. We've found out what many, many people want to get loud about. And so wrapping us up for the day, last but not least, we're talking about the innovation of food to table access. And throughout COVID-19, we all know that there have been a number of new and exciting barriers uh, and challenges to work around as it comes to food access. Um, in many cases, uh, transportation uh, becomes an issue and we're in lockdown and, and folks can no longer get to fresh food retail outlets. Farmers markets have closed down. Um, we, we've, we're faced all of a sudden with um, these unexpected food access barriers. And so that doesn't mean everything stops. That just means everyone gets to work and starts to adjust and shift and innovate. And we saw so, so many programs that um, provide a bridge to food access or that um, bring fresh food actually to a community where no fresh food outlet exists. Uh, that you know have had to close down, but then again, through lots of work, have restarted with a different uh, approach. And so today we're talking about what that looks like. Um, we have four great speakers, Jill Mulholland, um, Aaron Schantz, uh, Data Bernada, and Jen, Jennifer Pitt. And so I will provide an introduction to each of these folks um, as we move along. Oh, and Aaron Schantz is now in the room. So that's, that's wonderful. Hi, Aaron, we're happy you made it in. <laughs> and so um, I'd like to first start off with Jill Mulholland. So Jill is actually a steering committee member of uh, Food for All New Brunswick. She's a manager with uh, the Department of Agriculture, Aquaculture and Fisheries in the marketing area and works hard to bring the uh, local food and beverage strategy to our plates. Jill, I am cutting your bio a little bit short. I hope you don't mind. Um, and I'm gonna oh, no, go right ahead and I'm gonna hand the mic right over to you to take it away. All right, thank you, Jill. Uh, so, am I, everybody can hear me okay? Yeah. All right, great. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here today. Um, as Jill mentioned, um, I am the manager of the local food market development for New Brunswick's Department of Agriculture, Aquaculture and Fisheries, and also a proud ex officio uh, steering committee member for Food for All. So it's a great pleasure to be here today and take part in this uh, great panel. So thank you for that invitation. Uh, I'm going to share my screen and talk to you guys a little bit about the local food and beverage strategy. Uh, as Jill mentioned, there's been a, a number of barriers and one of those is, you know, it, it's been tough on the communication front, I think, because, uh, you know, the news is filled with COVID uh, communication and to get a lot of information through on the local food and beverage strategy and some of the progress has been tough as a result. So I'm really happy to have this opportunity to speak with you all. I am going to share my screen. And Jill, if you could let me know when it is up. Can you see it? I don't see it there. Now I see it. It's you do. Just not, not yet in presentation mode, but I can see. Okay. And if I do that, let's see if that works. Can you see it now? Perfect. Yep. That's okay. Great, Jill. Great. Oh, thanks so much. All right. So first, I'll just tell you a little bit about the department. So the New Brunswick Department of Agriculture, Aquaculture and Fisheries has an economic development mandate, and that's to facilitate the growth um, of the agriculture, aquaculture and fisheries, as well as value added sectors um, through improving economic competitiveness, sustainable development and success of these sectors and related industries. And a part of that mandate is the local food and beverage strategy. So just to backtrack a little bit, um, 
to tell you where we came from. So this is the second iteration of the provincial local foods and beverage strategy. And back in 2019, um, we decided to take a very different approach for the development of this strategy. Uh, we sought to develop it from the ground up. We had heard on the last strategy that a lot of our industry partners did not see themselves in that last strategy, that it really needed to be uh, about the ideas from industry and really to develop a, a strong strategy that was very inclusive and supportive of all. Uh, so we start and so the plan was to take those ideas from those engagement sessions and then for a committee of uh, many government, provincial government departments, as well as the federal government and some provincially focused um, industry partners, as well as in Indigenous representatives to interpret those ideas that came from those engagements into the local food and beverage strategy. So we started to go through that process. And then of course the pandemic hit. And really that was a time where we had to press pause and really it, it helped gain perspective, but it also emphasized a lot of the ideas that we had heard from industry in the first place through those engagements. Some of those problems became highlighted even stronger through the pandemic. Some of the needs and that required support became stronger. Um, and there was also some really great success and innovative thinking that came from the pandemic as well that was worth sharing. So we took a little bit more time to incorporate some of those impacts that came from the pandemic as well into this strategy. And then in January, uh, of uh, 2021, we launched uh, the second iteration of the provincial local food and beverage strategy. Um, and we decided to make it the four year strategy uh, from 2021 to 2025. And we also um, will be reporting annually on the progress of the strategy. Uh, and we're right now in the midst of collecting all the information from all the partners involved and all the initiatives inside the strategy to start preparing that annual report. And, and we look forward to sharing more information. As I mentioned, it's been a tough year on the communication front. So uh, hopefully that uh, report will be well received. All right. So now uh, I'll just again backtrack a little bit, but um, the local food and beverage strategy has three uh, pillars and uh, they are grow New Brunswick, buy New Brunswick and feed New Brunswick. And it's a bit of a funny story actually, uh, how we came to the conclusion of these uh, pillars. Uh, so we had, kind of created these buckets of information that came from the engagement sessions. And one was like education and training uh, and capacity building. And then there was also market development and marketing and uh, community food security and these great, very strong worded, uh, not as approachable uh, language, I should say. and. Uh, so uh, my director and I sat back and we thought, oh, I wish we could just borrow what BC uses. So you, this might look a little familiar because they have a buy BC, feed BC, grow BC program. So we called BC and we asked them if we could borrow the names of their pillars and adapt them for our strategy. And they were very happy to, to and felt very complimented by that. So um, just to explain a little bit about what our pillars uh, for Grow New Brunswick represent. Uh, it will work to strengthen New Brunswick's food system through support, through improved support and focus programs to strengthen and grow our agriculture, aquaculture, and fishery sectors, including a special focus on Indigenous participants and their communities. Grow and Be will also work to grow our labor force to ensure that we have what is required to secure the long-term sustainability of our province's food 
industry. And by New Brunswick, we'll work uh, with industry stakeholders, participants, and Indigenous communities to develop initiatives and collaborative marketing that will improve the marketability, visibility, and awareness and demand of local products. Uh, by MB will also work to increase opportunities for local food and beverages through procurement uh, with public institutions. So looking at uh, strengthening, strengthening that as well. Feed New Brunswick uh, will encourage the growth of home and community gardens and collaborate with charitable organizations and communities to enhance the use of healthy local food in community programs and initiatives. So that's a bit of a snapshot on what each of our local food and beverage strategy pillars are about. So I thought it might be fun just to share with you. I knew I didn't have a lot of time to go through everything, but um, I, we're very proud of uh, some of the impacts of our uh, local food and beverage strategy campaign uh, that was run this summer. Um, and really we thought about public trust, about the pandemic and how we could really help better support our New Brunswick uh, food and beverage industry. We recognize that, you know, through the pandemic, there was an increase in interest and support for local food. But then when restrictions started to really uh, lessen and everybody started moving around again like normal, that we so started to see that uh, demand for local products, food and beverage products, start to level out as well. So we wanted to remind them, and who better to remind them than the industry themselves. So we hired a summer student who went out and interviewed um, our food and beverage industry and got them to share what the support of New Brunswickers meant to them. Um, and this was really successful. Um, I think that our industry felt success, uh, felt that appreciation and New Brunswickers responded. Um, so we saw our social media channels grow the support and engagements um, grow by almost 70%. That's, that's really big. And uh, this is not paid programming. This is just uh, food and beverage producers, uh, just speaking directly to, um, to New Brunswickers about their business and, and why their support matters to them. So uh, really great results came from that as well. Um, and I know I, I, um, I might, I, I was gonna cut it off here, but I have, um, if anybody has any questions that they want to ask, uh, otherwise, uh, thank you. I, there's a lot, a lot of other things going on, but I didn't think I had a lot of time. Uh, so I did just give you a snapshot of our summer campaign there. Jill, thanks so much. And if Thank we you. could, I'll encourage everyone to put their questions in the chat. And Jill, don't go anywhere, okay? Okay. We'll, yep. we'll, we'll move that, that question period just to the end. Oh, thank sure. You, yeah. Thank you so much. For, Thank you um, for the opportunity. Appreciate yeah. it. Yeah. And you know, what you're talking about, it just reminds me of, of all of that support for local. Um, next, I'll welcome Aaron Schantz to speak. And before I do, um, you know, just remembering at the outset of the pandemic, how local farmers were ready to jump in and to um, <clears throat> jump in and to support and say, we're here, we're ready to put seeds in the ground. We don't know what will happen with COVID-19. And so what are the solutions that we need at this moment? Um, there were local beef uh, and meat producers bringing their product into uh, small gas stations. That was an example from Sackville, New Brunswick that you know, all of a sudden you can go to the gas station and, and get a, a really high quality local meat. Food for all pulled together, crowdsourced, CSA map that had about 12,000 views in a very short period of time. And so, you know, your point about how we are starting to waver out of restrictions in some ways, it really does impact that ebb and flow. And so 
I will welcome Aaron Schantz now. Um, Aaron is Aaron and his wife Shelley have a small farm in St. Marie de Kent called Irodel Farm. And they've been raising their family here, um, their family of four here uh, for about nine years. And so they're building up small livestock and vegetable farm. Aaron has a, a couple of side hustles, but he's a local food activist as well. Um, he manages the woodlot uh, in their space and works contracts related to community development around food sovereignty and social justice. And so Aaron, I will hand it over to you. Thanks a lot. Hi everyone, excited to, uh, to talk to you guys. So yeah, so basically talking about the um, kind of the impact on our operations. So we're a, we're a pretty small farm. Um, Nirondel Farm produces probably, we, we probably only use about one acre of land uh, for our productions outside of like our poultry, um, our chickens that we just drag around in um, big chicken coops in the field. So don't you, we're not very big, but through um, CSAs, through um, a deal that I'll speak about in a second that we've worked out with the food depot to bring fresh local food to um, to food banks. And also with, uh, we do a lot of canning and preserving also. So that's kind of what we do. So our operation does make about $120,000 in sales per year, but um, it takes a lot to make that happen for a small farm. So that's just barely enough to keep a small far farm going. So that's why I have the odd side hustle. So my wife, Shelly, runs the, runs the farm. And um, so, yeah, so kind of what happened when the, when the um, pandemic hit, um, what we immediately realized is we're like the one thing, the one advantage of all the small farms in New Brunswick is that as opposed to a larger operation, we can, we can act really quick. So immediately we started thinking, what can we do right away? Because we're the producers that we, in order to survive, we have to get our produce to market in May. So in order to have vegetables ready to go in May, we have to start growing in February. So we're already a little bit late for being able to react fast, but we still knew we had time to react. So then we got together and we started thinking, how can we react fast? And basically we're trying to save our own butts because we don't even know if there's gonna be a farmer's market or not. And the difference with us and maybe a larger type farm, they're deciding whether they should plant or not. We have no choice, either we plant or we have zero income. And being small farmers, we don't have access to any CERB, anything. There's zero access because you're running your own business. So you don't have any social services. So that's why it really got us creative and it got us working together. The first idea that we came up with within a week of the pandemic was all kinds of people are in need of work. All kinds of people aren't CERB, they're students. And the one thing that keeps most small farms from being able to grow to anything bigger than a small farm is manpower. The most expensive thing in producing vegetables is your manpower. And we're like, what a great opportunity to, instead of putting emergency funding into buying food from the outside, take that emergency funding, let's hire people that are ready to work. And we basically broke it down to how, many, how much value of food we could produce per employee. So we knew we could handle probably two more employees. Those two more employees would allow us to grow, you know, like it was roughly about something like $60,000 more food. And then we thought, let's multiply that by the number of small farms we knew. And we we're like, we could probably increase the food supply significantly, basically in a matter of a month because we could plant it. We have employees. We have the things that we already started. We have the greenhouses. So we're really excited about that idea. And we submitted that to government. We got as many partners as we could. We got the food bank on board. So we had a source, you know, someone that would buy the food, all that kind of stuff. And we could do it because if someone paid for the employees, we could sell it at a way cheaper price than we normally sell it because employees are our biggest cost. So because of the speed at which um, our government reacted to the pandemic, when we came to them two weeks, two or three weeks into the pandemic with a proposal, they declined the proposal saying that we're in an emergency phase and this is not, we're not looking at these kind of ideas. We're not looking at food supply right now. So that idea basically, we didn't have time to make that happen. But what was great is Food for All 
is hosting these conversations every single week. So we shared this project and, and just because we got turned down by the government, we were by decision makers, we're, there's enough groundswell, there's enough people online ready to go that we said, hey, let's just shift it. The food bank decided we don't wanna give up on this idea. We want this fresh local food at a guaranteed price because we don't know what's gonna be on the market for us to buy or what are we going to feed our clients in three or four months if, if there's been a collapse in the food system? So what we did is together, we figured out what kind of vegetables they would want to grow. And then we got our farms together because none of us could produce the amount of food they needed. So by getting together, we basically said, how much money do you have to buy food for people this summer? They gave us a number and they gave us what they what food bank clients need the most as far as vegetables. So we ended up with a list of a dozen vegetables. We got together with five small farms in the Southeast um, of New Brunswick. And basically what we did is we did like a huge CSA. So the government or like the, um, the money that Food Depot got, they just put that money down on the table. And then we put together a schedule of when and where they're gonna get that food. And it was like, it worked out really good because they had a guaranteed price. So they didn't have to worry about the price. It was an agreeable price. It was, it was close to what you'd get at a grocery store. It was fresh organic produce. And so it was a deal like they couldn't turn down the deal because they, loved, they really liked the idea and we could actually do it by combining. So what we did is amongst us, we organized every week to deliver X amount of vegetables at you know, and we did our best to stick to that schedule. The super advantage about this, the advantage about this program is um, basically the food is super fresh. So food banks have trouble storing food because a lot of times they're getting the leftovers from the grocery store. What they were getting from us was harvested in the last 24 hours. So super fresh, straight from the field to the food bank. Um, and then what happened was, is we didn't, require much transportation costs because we were already going into town to go to market and stuff like that. So that was one great advantage. The other one is for the food bank, they didn't have to worry about, about buying, about finding sources to buy from. There was no paperwork, no purchase orders, no nothing. It was one contract signed at the beginning of the season. This is what you're going to get. You paid us. And by them, us signing, by us all signing on the contract and all the farmers being paid, we're actually able to use that money immediately to boost our production right away. We had cash on hand, boosted our production. And then what happened was there's no responsibility on the food bank's end because we've made a commitment. So if we don't have carrots, when we said we were going to have carrots, we have to go out and find carrots and we're connected with other farms. So, and then what we also did is a lot of us had crop failures. If you guys remember, that was a really bad drought year, but we were able to get past crop failures because um, if one farm didn't have something, another farm in another region that was part of the group had it. So we were actually able to trade amongst ourselves to make sure the food depot got what they needed. And sometimes we couldn't get it, but then we could organize. We just organized ourselves to make sure we kept that flow going. And at the end of the year, um, we slapped that whole idea together, was put together in a, it's in two weeks. So we put all that information together in two weeks. We already started, we we're ready to go and we were able to start delivering. And, um, and then this year, what happened is we redid the same deal, but we got to organize, we got to learn from the past. And so we have a model that works really good. So that really helped us as a small farm. Um, as far as New food access trends. What was really interesting is at the farmer's market, when we actually could go to the farmer's market, way less customers, but our core customers were the ones that kept us going. So a small farm like us has only had probably 30 or 40 customers. We lost the tourists. We lost a lot of the people that come to the farmer's market, but the core customers still supported us. And so between that and being able to adapt to the food bank, um, adapt. We built a little kiosk. People would come to the farm. So that got us through the first COVID year. The interesting thing about the second COVID year is all that excitement about needing food amongst customers definitely dropped. 
So I think a lot of farms that offer CSAs, they had this huge explosion in people buying CSAs the first year of the pandemic, second year of the pandemic, oh, we're, we might still have food after all. So they shrunk back. And so we're back to like a normal level and markets are working. Booktouche Farmers Market's a small market that works really well for us. And um, even though there's less people, um, we didn't notice a big difference in sales at all. And we've been able to keep on going steadily. Um, but again, we're never going to grow because there are barriers. But all the barriers that we face as a small farm are the exact same barriers we faced before the pandemic. And they're still present. But I don't feel a need to bring those up because it would take some time. And the other thing is they're not affected by COVID. Those are problems that small farmers faced before and we still face now. So that's kind of my point of view on COVID from our point of view. Wow, you really got that in under your time. Well done, Aaron. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> you get a you get a, a gold star. Um, you know, everything you've shared, it just makes me think about how invisible so many parts of our food systems are to us on a regular basis. So you know, it, it's, you've got to be intimately involved with ordering and distribution and delivery to understand those true impacts that are um, behind it all. And so from a food bank perspective, knowing like, oh, are we going to have access to the, to those same markets that we did? Um, you know, what will it look like for transportation of food? And then I, I guess it's, it's this people power thing. There is power with having additional support on the farm. And then, you know, we're moving over in a moment to, to data uh, Brunata here, which this, this idea of small firms banding together um, and the cooperative model and what kinds of um, power that can bring to uh, the small firm, which is such an integral part of our food system. So Aaron, thank you for that. Um, I'm excited to, to be back in the space so that we can say, wait, we, we learned a lot over the past two years. What do we need now? Oh, and, and I guess one thing we hear time and time again is it takes planning, right? Farmers need a plan and we need to know early so that um, seeds can go in the ground and that there's time. So thank you, Aaron. I am going to introduce now Data Bernada. Uh, who is a landed immigrant from Indonesia and who's lived in Canada intermitt intermittently uh, for 12 years. And so having access um, himself to serve money, he was able to shift his attention and his energy to learn temperate climate, human scale farming and permaculture. So following um, Dada's learnings, he was inspired to start a cooperative farm with some friends this past spring uh, to grow and sell vegetables and flowers. So Dada, over to you. Thank you, Jill, for the introduction. And first of all, uh, thank you for having me here. I'm uh, quite excited to be invited to this uh, event. And I would actually like to learn more about, uh, and it's, it's very interesting, especially what Aaron just uh, presented. I, we kind of have a similar uh, experience, but in a different level. I'm going to share my screen here because I do need uh, some guide to can start sharing with all participants. Okay, and let me just check here. While you're doing that, I need to correct myself. Data. Yeah. I've been calling you data, and that is not the way to pronounce your name. So. Oh no no data. no no. no. <laughs> yeah. Both is good. Yeah, I, I like both actually. <laughs> okay. I don't, yeah. And we can see your screen now. You'll you can see that. Okay. Yeah, we can see that. We'll just. Um, can you see the, the the full now presentation? Now we can see your next slide coming. So if you have any speaker notes, we'll be able to see that. Um, okay. That sometimes happens when you have two screens, but there are some display settings up top, as you can see. Um, okay, I'll just use this then. Is this good? Yep, that's great. That works. Okay, so first I would like to make a, an acknowledgement that we operate in the unceded territory of the Wallace Creek, Mi'kmaq and Pascoto Mufkati. Uh, I introduced myself a little bit, being an immigrant, if you can say. Uh, back in Indonesia, the, coming to Canada, there's one thing that I would like to share, especially this is regarding food. Indonesia is a multi-ethnic uh, country. When we go travel to certain province, what we would like to know about that place is, you know, what's the food? You know, what's the restaurant? So when I came to Canada, and this is not just me, several people that came to Canada, they come back to Indonesia and they 
say, well, everything's nice, beautiful, but you cannot actually find the native Indian food the restaurant there. So and I came here uh, in Ontario about 12, more than 12 years ago, actually. And I couldn't even find the native Indian other than the, there's one student and there's one homeless uh, person that I kind of have chat with in Toronto. Uh, having said that, I just want to share how being in, from Indonesia, coming to Canada, where apparently colonialism is still here, but it's so subtle. Uh, it gives, creates a certain uh, impression in me. And as you can see, uh, Toasa Cooperative, uh, I'm one of the founder, other than me, there's uh, Chris, actually, Chris Randall also was uh, uh, presenting earlier. He's a community organizer from uh, Hampton and also Tom Cunningham, uh, late Tom, Tom Cunningham, uh, owner of a farm. Uh, let me check here. So coming back to that colonialism things, uh, one of the things that I would uh, like to do with Toasa is to create a space where you can decolonize, you know, like there's a, a business that is also a decolonizing uh, aspect to it. I'm just going to go to the, okay, so first we were invited to kind of help Tom Cunningham uh, to regenerate his farm in Riverbank. And Toasa is actually his kind of brand. He goes to the market selling chocolate with Toasa brand for Tom and Asa. Asa is his dad. Apparently in Bhutanese, which uh, we have a friend also who's actually one of the starter of the co-op from Bhutan, his name is Shering. It means friendship. So we like that idea and we keep that name. Uh, to make a story short, you know, we decided we will create a co-op where the co-op will actually sign a lease with Tom. So we have a little more like a warranty, guarantee of that, the continuity of working there. So May 13th, it's an incorporated. May 14th, Tom died. Okay, and the farm is put in the market. And uh, because there's cooperative, we're gonna have a discussion and we decided let's, as the current owner, you know, like we can take the farming assets, including some plants that Tom left, like uh, gladiol bulbs. Uh, and the, the farm itself is actually more of a flower farm, I would say. He tries to grow vegetable, but not much. That's why he actually, invited us to kind of help him with that. Okay, so since we cannot stay in, the, in that uh, farm anymore, we have to move out. And we decided that we will still continue our effort to regenerate uh, whatever piece of land that we can find. Uh, we reach out to community. And from three, oops, sorry, from three uh, founders, now we grew into 14 members. Uh, as of November 21st, they're mostly like small scale farmer. There's only one small scale farmer actually. The rest are mostly gardeners and parliamentarians. There's one activist, uh, mostly general citizens. And in terms of production sites, we are still, uh, actually at the moment, we cannot actually harvest anything anymore from Riverbank from the current, uh, from the initial farm. Now we have a Norwegian Bok Loop. There's one property, 1.7 acres that we managed to kind of work together to work on the land and also a hill road. This is for our uh, flower production. Okay, what we try to do is we actually try to run the economic activities like a family farm where, you know, with family farm, everybody like member of a family, like blood related, there's no issues with trust, but as, uh, as, as strangers, but we want to run it like a family farm, we have to, develop trust among each other. And we found that being transparent in especially financial matters, being professional and uh, participatory, I guess, is essential. And our aim is actually to turn any idle productive lands into a source of abundance by idle productive land. At the moment, we have a land in Norwegian Walk Loop that we can actually work on. It already has deer fence. So we're kind of like lucky with that. We don't have to spend more money into doing, uh, uh, putting deer fence. And we do have uh, human scale ecological farming uh, few while we're doing that, people, planet, profit. Uh, and coming back to the colonialism aspect, uh, you would like this to be part of a decolonization uh, 
So we kind of, well, I personally also try to get in touch with our uh, indigenous friends, uh, just updating them what we're doing, you know, as part of the peace and friendship and all that stuff. Okay, and this is what we've learned so far. And I found also this is, uh, this is actually work on decolonizing from what I see. So we talked to other landowners other than the one in Norwegian Walk Loop. Uh, several lands that we kind of try to work on to move from the farm. And there is actually the problem of trust where they, they thought, well, maybe we're going to take advantage of them or maybe we're going to be taken advantage by the landlord and all that stuff, right? So there is, uh, we have to balance between, we have to respect, you know, like they, they have this private ownership there, but how can we uh, kind of persuade them or show them that uh, if that private ownership, that idle land belong to a private uh, uh, person could actually be used in a, for community use in terms of community use here means that produce something that will benefit the community, then it, it becomes something that's more beautiful, it's more productive. So that's uh, what we are trying to do. And then money logic versus people logic. So yeah, I mean, we, this is what I'm saying is, it's not just economic, uh, reason that we want to do this. Sometimes we have to actually spend more money uh, and effort and labor, but the benefit of bringing people together is also worthwhile. Now, transaction versus relation, uh, this is also basically like pure business or just cultural. Extractive and cultivations. This is basically means, uh, yeah, we, we are trying to save all the seeds and from the old farm, rather than just selling the farming equipment and all that stuff. Uh, secrecy versus transparency. This is more like a management uh, in the co-op itself. Even if it's, if it's a co-op, there's still uh, the chance that uh, people are not, it's not transparent enough, for example. So we try to uh, work through that. Delegation participation is also a management things in the co-op. We want people to get more involved and engage, not just leaving it to the board, for example. And data, okay. while you're transferring to slides, I'm just looking at time and I see you have 13 more slides, so you have five more minutes. Oh, no, it's time. okay. I actually, yeah, thank you. Yeah, I left the slides in case I, you know, I don't spend the time. So this is uh, the marketing during pandemic. So we found that, uh, yeah, there is CSA boxes. It's kind of like textbook, uh, human scale uh, gardening or farming uh, way of marketing. But we found that it's easier to actually spend uh, in, an, uh, sorry, to sell in farmer's market. And what we also found is actually roadside stall or kiosk because we are not small farmers like Aaron's there where we already have a good production. We're still small. And now we are, uh, I'm actually thinking of exploring of opening more outside stalls and working with people maybe uptown where the concentration of uh, population is to maybe uh, put our produce there. Okay, some thoughts and questions. So this is uh, more like a general idea. Like I mentioned, reaching people uptown, that's where the poverty is, where people actually need uh, quality food and how, how can we do that? Uh, we have to share resources. So I was thinking maybe we can go there and talk to people uptown, you know, and maybe even share a space that they can grow and then open a stall over there. And I guess the idea is actually to decentralize these marketing channels as much as we can. It's kind of kind of like go back to third wall or where I'm from, where in all corners you see people are setting up vegetable stalls and all that stuff. And I thought, yeah, why not? You know, it seems to work. And maybe we can do it in a, in a more modern way, for example. And uh, can government make the process of starting a co-op more simple streamlined? This is basically also an idea. These people uptown, for example, if they agree to sell things, maybe they can create a co-op or like a distribution co-op where they have to stall and they, they make a business. So uh, we actually try to do this not as a, as a hobby or a charity, but more like a viable small business. Okay, a return to the commons is basically the also the general idea of decolonization too, I would say. How can uh, 
this land that belongs to, I mean, if you talk about land back, you know, you want to return it to the indigenous. Well, I'm not, I'm not the indigenous person myself. I mean, if you want to box it that way, but I think this is where the, the meeting point between that land back and how we can actually uh, uh, go to a better way of produ producing food or being a society that's not uh, colonialist is that we share. We share the commons. Maybe a government has some idle land. They can just, you know, open it up to be, you know, uh, planted as a, as a community garden and make it into a viable business. So yeah, this is probably I don't know if you even got the chance to read the whole thing. Yeah, this is our criticism, if I can say. Uh, so far, it seems like uh, the government government has been actually quite. Uh, supportive in, in uh, subsidizing, if I can say, uh, the needs of human uh, small scale farmers, but there's still room for improvement, I would say. And the focus on commercialized uh, large scale uh, industrial uh, agriculture should probably be shifted to a small scale and more uh, democratic and decentralized one. We need to create a more diverse ecosystem of uh, fruit production where the small scale, human scale family farm or community farm could actually thrive there. And that actually, I, I believe that also creates more resilience for local uh, food production or food system. Uh, this is some of the stuff that we uh, uh, sell to potential members, you know, shared labor, shared profits. So whatever economic project, like we did garlic planting and also peonies. Uh, preservation projects. If there is profit that we make from that, we will share it based on the amount of work that these uh, uh, people are contributing. Uh, that's basically it. So, so I guess that's that's about it. Maybe I have what? Just wanna yeah. This is uh, how to reach us. That's it. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much, Data. Um, what a great presentation. It's really interesting to hear about all of the things that you're, you're doing. I'm so sad to hear about the loss of your friend. So condolences um, for your friend, Tom. But it's really beautiful that you've been able to maintain and, and bring this forward in the spirit of friendship. Uh, and so what a great um, presentation to remind us, how do we decolonize the way that we're thinking about our, our businesses and our programming and the land itself, how we use it together, how we share it. Um, and, you know, this is really linking back to so many of the conversations we've had earlier about uh, what are some of the ways that we can adjust and um, learn about uh, bylaws and about how we make it possible for um, local food access and decentralized food access to become more of a, um, it, it's really, you know, comes back to a concept of food sovereignty in so many ways. So it's really great to hear um, the, the perspective you're coming from. Um, we have one more speaker and then we'll, we'll move over into Q&A from there. So I'm excited for that. But before we do, uh, last and of course, certainly not least, um, we have Jennifer Pitre. Uh, and Jennifer has been working in the field of social work for over 25 years. She works as the executive director with the Shalur Community Inclusion Network and also contributes immensely to food security in that region. I can definitely attest to that. The Shalur Resiliency Committee and the uh, Shalur Chamber of Com Commerce. So she holds a social work degree from the University of Moncton and currently resides in Bathurst with her twin boys and Mrs. Puff. And Mrs. Puff. Was, right. All right. So Jen, over to you. Um, hi, everybody. So I'm uh, uh, Jen, and I just want to make sure that everybody has their interpretation on because I'll be presenting uh, this afternoon in French. So I just wanted to make sure that anybody who wanted to uh, listen in in English that you're able to switch over. Donc, uh, comme Jill uh, vous le dit, uh, moi je suis la directrice du réseau d'inclusion communautaire de la région Chala. Si euh, j'ai pas des beaux PowerPoint puis des, des, des diapos comme les autres, mais je suis juste ici pour vous partager un peu notre histoire. 
Euh, en gros, euh, au niveau de la sécurité alimentaire dans la région Chaleur, on a... Euh, on n'a pas de coordinateur comme tel qui s'occupe euh, de ces initiatives-là. Donc, euh, lorsque la pandémie COVID a commencé, euh, notre, co notre coordinateur, à ce moment-là, il trouvait que c'était beaucoup trop lourd pour lui d'entamer euh, euh, le développement des projets au niveau de la sécurité alimentaire en, pendant la pandémie. Donc, il nous a quittés pour faire autre chose. Puis, euh, euh, moi, ben, je voyais la, la demande, la valeur, la nécessité euh, des initiatives de sécurité alimentaire. Donc, j'ai épaulé, j'ai épaulé ces projets-là euh, euh, un peu dans le cadre de mon emploi, mais aussi beaucoup euh, au niveau de bénévolat euh, pour assurer le, 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 la continuité des projets. Mais... Euh, euh, Aaron, tantôt, nous parlait qu'il y avait eu un gros boom à un moment donné pour lui quand il y avait beaucoup de craintes en lien avec euh, euh, la pandémie. Puis, euh, on, on avait toute peur là, que le, le, on allait plus avoir accès à, de la, à des aliments, puis la, la, la chaîne de distribution. Puis, on s'est tout dit, que, en tout cas, on s'imaginait des histoires de, de Walking Dead. Là. Bon, fait que là, euh, euh, nous aussi, on a vécu ça. Fait que je vais retourner un peu à l'arrière puis je vais vous expliquer comment on l'a vécu. Fait que euh, lorsque la pandémie a... Ou à, tout, juste avant la pandémie, on avait à peu près 200 sacs de vendus par mois dans notre initiative de... de ça s'appelle Manger fraîche à la Eat Fresh. Puis c'est un, un projet où est-ce qu'on achète des aliments gros. Euh, on en fait le repactage de, de sacs d'aliments qu'on en fait la distribution dans notre région. Euh, on travaille parfois avec des fermiers locaux pour mettre de leurs produits dans, notre, dans les sacs, mais l'intention de notre sac, c'est vraiment de pouvoir avoir le meilleur prix pour les aliments qu'on on achète. Donc, on achète d'un organisme euh, basé à Fredericton qui s'appelle Fresh Choice. Mais lorsqu'on fait la sélection des aliments qu'on place dans notre sac, on essaie le plus possible de choisir des aliments qui sont euh, premièrement Nouveau-Brunswick. Par la suite, bien, on s'en va comme genre euh, province maritime. Puis là, des fois, bien, on met des, des petites traite, si tu veux, ben, tu sais, c'est pas évident d'avoir euh, nécessairement tout, euh, on ne fait pas pousser des mangues ici. Fait que si je place des mangues, ben, c'est certain qu'ils ne viennent pas du <rire> local. Euh, mais bon, tout ça pour dire qu'on avait à peu près 200 sacs par mois qu'on vendait euh, dans cette initiative-là euh, pré-COVID. Puis, euh, lorsque COVID a commencé, nous, on a été fermés. Euh, la santé publique était genre un peu pas certain où nous placer, puis on n'était pas un restaurant, on n'était pas un distributeur, on n'était pas un centre d'épicerie. Fait que personne ne savait trop, trop quoi faire avec nous autres. En plus que notre centre d'impactage a fermé parce que les autres ne rencontraient pas les exigences COVID, là, de, 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 les préoccupations puis les, les protocoles. Fait que on a quand on a réouvert trois mois plus tard, on était rendu à 90 sacs par mois. Donc, on avait diminué de plus de la moitié de nos sacs qu'on en faisait la distribution. Puis, euh, on se disait, ça va fermer, ça ne va pas marcher, on ne on, on peut, peut pas continuer. On, notre, notre commande minimale de sacs, c'est 100 sacs. Fait qu'à chaque mois, on perdait de l'argent à faire les commandes. Donc là, on a fait un gros boost, on a été voir les gens dans la communauté pour voir euh, pourquoi il y avait, ben là, c'est certain qu'il y avait tout le marketing de, de les rappeler qu'on était là, là, mais là, pourquoi qu'ils auraient à commander et tout? Puis en gros, c'est que les gens avaient peur. Les gens avaient beaucoup peur de sortir de la maison, de se rendre à quelque part, d'aller chercher ces aliments, d'avoir contact avec d'autres humains qui allaient contracter le COVID. Euh, fait que ce qu'on a fait, c'est qu'on a commencé à offrir euh, le service de livraison pour nos sacs. Euh, on a aussi développé un site web où est-ce qu'on peut accepter des paiements par virement Interact. Fait que ça coûte très cher. C'est très dispendieux de euh, accept, ben, prendre des cartes de crédit. Fait qu'on n'a pas fait cette voie-là, mais on peut prendre des, euh, des e-transfers ou des virements bancaires. Donc, juste à, à, à rajouter ces deux services-là, 
Euh, on a passé de 90 sacs par mois et trois mois plus tard, on était rendu à 500 sacs par mois. Donc, euh, ça a vraiment vécu un énorme succès. Puis, et voilà, comme que Aaron disait tantôt, notre gros boom que nous, on a fait face, là, tu sais, que le monde, comme je dis, le Walking Dead, là, il était tout stressé. Bien, c'était ça. Donc, on a fait, sept, fait 500 sacs pour quelques mois. Puis, on a vu, bien, c'est ça, l'été est arrivé, puis il y avait plusieurs personnes qui achètent les bois d'agriculture euh, communautaire. Fait que là, les gens, ils achetaient plus les sacs mangés frais parce qu'il y avait beaucoup d'aliments frais dans leurs bois euh, communautaires. Euh, puis, on a créé des partenariats avec ces fermiers-là parce que pour nous, ce n'est pas viable de pouvoir se permettre de payer ce que les autres ils doivent demander pour tu sais, les prix de leurs aliments. Puis, pour beaucoup des petites fermes de notre région, ce n'était pas viable de dire, ben oui, ben je vais te fournir, admettons, euh, euh, 500 sacs de 5 livres de patates. Tu sais, je prenais tout leur inventaire. Puis, anyway. Fait que ce qu'on a fait, on a créé des partenariats, puis on fait, en anglais, on dirait du cross-marketing, mais on partage l'information par rapport à nos initiatives entre nous deux. Fait que euh, tout au courant de l'été, puis lorsque c'était le temps d'acheter les sacs euh, ou les, les boîtes d'agriculture communautaire, on a fait des petites entrevues Facebook, on a fait beaucoup de partage de, des informations de ces fermes-là à travers de notre network. Fait que euh, nous... Euh, Juste pour vous donner un exemple, euh, euh, on, a, on a un gros following, puis le monde partage beaucoup sur notre page Facebook. Fait que sans payer de publicité sur notre page, euh, je peux facilement, à l'intérieur de 24 heures, avoir un reach de 2 à 3 000 personnes pour mes posts. Fait que euh, ça a beaucoup aidé nos fermiers de pouvoir faire ça. Tu sais, que eux autres, il n'y avait pas nécessairement un, le temps, là, on se comprend que ça prend du temps à être fermier, puis qu'ils n'ont pas nécessairement les ressources ou même les, les, les je ne veux pas dire les capacités dans le sens d'être assez intelligent, mais tu sais, de, de, ça, prend, ça prend des outils, ça prend un. un, un, un ça prend un software, ça prend un matériel pour créer des posts, puis savoir c'est quoi les mots-clés qu'il faut placer pour attirer l'attention, puis après ça, tu sais, de les partager de façon stratégique pour les gens le voient. Bien, ça, ce n'est pas nécessairement le même skill set qu'un fermier aurait. Mais ça étant dit, moi, je ne suis pas fermière, là. So, je n'ai pas la skill set de fermière. Tu sais, si on se comprend là, que, que je ne suis pas en train de de diminuer les habiletés de quelqu'un ou les connaissances, mais c'est juste que on, on, on fait ce qu'on fait, right? Bon. Fait que là, euh, juste à faire ces partages-là, les autres aussi ils ont vu une augmentation euh, dans leur, euh, dans leur euh, 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 demande. Euh, parce que nous, on voit, nos projets sont communautaires et de base coopérative et non de base euh, de compétitive. Euh, il y a quelqu'un d'autre qui pourrait ouvrir un autre projet pareil comme le mien avec les mêmes sacs, puis je vais en faire la publicité parce que notre intention, c'est de pouvoir assurer que les gens de notre région ont accès à, accès, excuse, à des fruits et légumes frais à prix abordable. Fait que peu importe comment moi je peux faire pour m'assurer que les autres ils reçoivent ces aliments-là, c'est ce qu'on va faire. Euh, fait que c'est ça, tantôt je disais que je me dis, ça va fermer, on ne va pas pouvoir faire ça. Puis on a vu ce gros boom-là. Mais lorsque on faisait le, 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 le redéveloppement du projet, il y a eu des moments que tu sais, ça a été difficile. Le monde vivait beaucoup de peur. Puis nous, on recevait beaucoup d'appels de gens. Que, tu sais, la peur, ça fait, ça fait toutes sortes d'affaires chez les gens. Puis il y en a qui étaient moins peut-être gentils que d'autres. Puis tu sais, on a reçu, tu sais, pas nécessairement des plaintes, mais tu sais, des craintes. Fait que euh, les, euh, les, 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 ça, ça a été difficile. Moi, je me suis dit, OK, ben là, comme je fais ça, c'est du bénévolat, je donne 20 à 30 heures semaine en bénévolat pour ce site, puis tu veux me dire que tu vas me critiquer? Non, I don't think so. Sauf que là, on a commencé à avoir des appels de personnes qui nous disaient que c'était les seuls fruits et légumes qui pouvaient s'acheter par mois. C'est les seuls qui mangeaient. Euh, des histoires comme que des parents avec des enfants qui ont des enfants qui sont très particuliers dans ce qu'ils mangent, puis que les enfants disaient « Ah, c'est le sac surprise de fruits et légumes, puis ils avaient hâte de manger qu'est-ce qu'il y avait dans le sac. » Mais tu sais, comme d'habitude, des brocolis, oublie ça, là. 
<rire> il n'aurait jamais mangé, mais ça a venu d'un sac surprise. Euh, J'ai aussi des personnes qui m'ont appelé pour dire que c'est ces aliments-là qui les permettaient de passer de une boîte de, leur, euh, de la banque alimentaire vers un autre. C'est ça qui, en anglais, on dirait bridge the gap. C'est ça qui comblait les jours manquants dans leur mois. Fait que là, ben, c'était commentaires là en fait que OK, on ne peut pas. On ne peut pas laisser ce projet-là mourir. Il faut vraiment faire en sorte que ça marche. Fait que, euh, pareil comme Erin, notre boom, c'est comme rétabli. On est rendu à peu près à 300 sacs par mois, qui est quand même super bien. Je n'ai jamais me plaindre. Puis j'ai l'impression que euh, décembre, janvier, février, ça va remonter un peu parce que euh, les prix, puis l'accessibilité aux aliments dans les épiceries, c'est cher, puis c'est pas toujours disponible sur les tablettes. Fait que euh, j'ai l'impression que ça va remonter de nouveau un peu. Mais euh, l'autre point que j'avais fait, c'est qu'on offrait aussi le transport. Puis ça, ça a été, euh, au début de COVID, un gros problème pour nous, parce que je sais pas si vous connaissez la région Chalard, mais moi, je suis à Bathurst. Donc, ça compte de Allerville à Belgium, fait que le nord est de la province du Nouveau-Brunswick. Puis Bathurst, c'est une ville, on va dire que c'est urbain, d'après les, les, euh, les, les, les critères pour être une ville. Là. Mais on est quand même dans une situation assez rurale ou une, une, une région rurale. Fait que euh, les, 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 euh, nous, nos petites épiceries, là, ben, ils n'offrent pas ça comme qu'ils ont chez Superstore que tu commandes en ligne avant et tu vas chercher des épiceries. Ça n'existe pas. Même que le Superstore qu'on a ici, ça existait, mais il n'y a pas personne qui utilisait ça. Tu sais, Ce n'était pas quelque chose qui était, qui était utilisé. Fait que les autres, ils ont vu une augmentation euh, là-dedans, mais euh, euh, pas assez. Fait que on a essayé de s'arranger avec un service de transport communautaire que nous, on est ici dans notre région, puis on fait la livraison d'épicerie pour les gens, euh, où on les apporte vers leur épicerie, peu importe ce qu'ils ont besoin. Mais pour nos sacs manger frais, euh, on voit que 60 des personnes qui achètent nos sacs, euh, ils en demandent la livraison. Fait qu'on fait cette livraison, on est allé chercher des fonds au niveau du gouvernement fédéral, puis euh, on, on, euh, le, la livraison des sacs est gratuite pour tout de suite, parce que c'est payé par le gouvernement fédéral. Fait que c'est ça, nous, euh, on est vraiment contents avec ce projet-là de pouvoir euh, 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 offrir ça à notre... Euh, à notre communauté. Puis là, je vois que Jill euh, a, a sauté les images sur mon écran. Là. Je pense qu'elle a fait pas mal le chronomètre. Fait que je vais passer ça de nouveau à Jill, puis c'est certain que je suis ouverte à si vous avez des questions ou des commentaires. Euh, puis j'aimerais juste remercier tous les autres présentateurs. Vous étiez pas mal plus euh, prêts et équipés euh, avec des belles présentations que moi. <rire> Oh, Jen, arrête ça. Merci <rire> beaucoup. Wow! De 90 à 500 sacs après déterminer. C'est quoi l'enjeu? Le, le, c'est quoi, quoi le, le, la barrière? Ah, euh... oh, le transport. Oui, ou bien, oui. Ouais, le, que vous avez ouais, ben, demandé comme la le monde question. avait peur de mm -hmm. se rendre, puis aussi de mm -hmm. donner accès à pouvoir payer avec euh, des, de l'interact, comme payer mm -hmm. non contact. Oui, oui. C'est vraiment Et incroyable. Dans trois que... mois. Ça yeah. a été. Wow. Euh... Yeah. C'est beaucoup plus d'heures en bénévolat. <rire> Et pour on a besoin de beaucoup plus de mains aussi. Oui. Alors, Et ça, c'est quelque merci. chose qu'on ne pourrait jamais faire sans l'aide de nos bénévoles. Puis, il mm ne -hmm. euh, faut jamais les laisser de côté puis les oublier parce que ces gens-là, euh, c'est eux autres qui font qu'on peut avoir des projets communautaires. Mm -hmm. Wow, ben merci beaucoup. Thank you so much to all of our presenters. We have, oh, we have eight minutes left. I think I have, now I am switched over into the interpretation section and I am hearing Peter in my ear. <laughs> and so that is messing me all up. I'd like to invite, um, I'd like to invite, uh, Aaron, could you share a little bit, uh, a little bit more about some of the ways that, um, and I'm sorry, I'm getting messed up because I can still hear this in my ear. I'm going to pause for a moment.
So maybe we can just pop to the Q and A. Um, I think Rosin or Hamani might have some questions. I also have some questions myself that I'm going to pop into the chat box. So maybe I'll I'll start with uh, my question. Um, how do we maintain this collaboration and local community food access now that COVID and food access isn't so present in uh, many citizens' minds as public spaces and international exchange is starting to flow back to normal? I feel like it's super important that we that what we're doing right now is we're talking about reminding ourselves of it but I also feel there needs to be some form of incentive, um, especially because I don't think things are gonna get economically better in any short time. It's normal that a two year pandemic is gonna give us a pretty hard hit. So I feel like finances, people's finances are tight. And uh, if, we're gonna, if we're gonna get local food on the, keep local food on the table, um, it's gonna take some incentives. Um, and usually financial incentives are always the best incentives. And if I may add on to that, uh, what Aaron just said, I really think that people have, so one of the points that I didn't get to in my presentation was um, the challenges and the possibilities. Donc, um, si que ce qu'on on, on, s'en va là-dessus, c'est que je pense que les défis auxquels on a fait face euh, pendant la COVID, ça nous a vraiment fait réaliser que, tu sais, on allait sur notre train, puis ça allait bien, puis bon, on était correct. Mais là, le, 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 la pandémie nous a vraiment comme arrêté sur les rails. Si euh, je pense que les personnes ont vu que c'est possible de faire des choses d'une autre façon, puis qu'on peut, on peut vraiment, ils vont continuer là-dedans, tu sais. Comme moi, j'ai des gens qui n'ont jamais acheté les sacs manger frais ou qui n'ont jamais entendu parler de, de bac alimentaire communautaire, puis, euh, tu sais, ils vont continuer là-dedans, là. Je pense que l'importance le, 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 de local a été euh, apportée comme vraiment à l'avant, uh, puisque ça va, il va y avoir une continuité de, de continuité de tout ça. I am back, and so I apologize for that uh, additional technical issue. I want to add, we have about four minutes left until the official end of Loud About Food, and so respecting time, if anyone must leave at that point, please don't hesitate. Um, but we're also we're also closing the full uh, event uh, just after that, and so I'd love to to keep you speakers um, engaged and and. Um, taking some time for more questions because you have a lot of really good ideas, I think. And so I want to give as much time to that as possible. Um, I would love to uh, ask if there's been consideration, um, Jen, I mean, I know there's, uh, Jen, je vais demander en français, en fait, um, dans la région de chaleur, uh, vous avez maintenant une opportunité d'accepter les paiements uh, e-transfer. On a vu uh, beaucoup de groupes qui ont fait cette décision durant la pandémie, probablement pour les mêmes raisons que vous. Et on a commencé la livraison, on a commencé à prendre des paiements um, de, de comptes bancaires au lieu de, du vrai argent. Et puis là, ça, 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 me, ça me fait demander la question, wow, comment est-ce que nous pouvons uh, collaborer entre eux? Les différentes, um, les différentes régions qui ont un programme de même. Est-ce qu'il y a des conversations, comme est-ce que est, ça, ça a été facile de connecter avec d'autres programmes entre les régions qui font euh, des choses similaires? Ah oui, absolument. Puis euh, je, serais, euh, je serais vraiment euh, 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 déçue si je n'en ferais pas mention, mais Suzanne White de la région Fredericton, Euh, qui est beaucoup active au niveau de la sécurité alimentaire dans la province, est vraiment incroyable euh, euh, dans le, le développement de ces initiatives-là. Puis euh, c'est grâce à elle qu'on a cette initiative-là dans la région Chaleur. Mais euh, 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 il y a aussi, qu on, on s'en on en parle souvent, fait que les coordinateurs des réseaux d'inclusion communautaire, euh, on s'est vraiment parlé beaucoup pendant la pandémie, 
Puis euh, ceux qui n'avaient pas de projet de ce style-là, ils l'ont commencé dans la région, euh, justement, à, dans la région Restigouche, ils vont commencer à utiliser les mêmes distributeurs que nous pour essayer de réduire les coûts. Fait que oui, euh, on est vraiment toujours ouvert au niveau de la province au complet de partager nos expériences, partager nos outils. Euh, Puis... Euh, euh, si jamais, soyez à l'aise de m'appeler, mais Suzanne White, euh, je vais te placer euh, dans la lumière un peu. Puis euh, je vais te dire que si vous avez à rejoindre Suzanne, euh, c'est tellement une ressource incroyable. Suzanne est still here, I will say. And I don't think she minds being voluntold for this sort of thing. She often <laughs> shares her contact information. Um, I would love to ask... Data or Jill, um, we haven't heard from you in a few, but I'm, I'm just thinking about some of these other innovations that have come up. Um, Data, you shared a number of different approaches to um, production and to selling and some great ideas about how to bring food closer to our communities. I'm wondering if you've um, you know, connected with other groups uh, over further over in that direction. So in the Charlotte County region, What are you seeing in terms of online marketing, uh, let's say, or, or bringing food, bringing markets online? Thank you. So that's also in the agenda, actually, to try to sell food online. Uh, we have also a member who's a small scale farmer who uh, tried to start to sell online other than doing CSA boxes and going to farmer's market. Uh, I will, uh, we will actually, we, we are actually still trying to form this co-op uh, into a working one at the moment, it's still in the formation. Uh, we will try that, but uh, to be honest, I feel like the being, having it uh, more direct and decentralized like that uh, kiosk seems to be uh, interesting, you know, the approach that we can, we can try. And in terms of connecting with uh, groups at the Charlotte County, no, we, we haven't actually reached out that much yet. We would love to. That's probably why we also joined this. Uh, and also, uh, if I can also address the previous questions by Jill about how to keep this uh, collaboration going in the post-COVID, if it is coming. Uh, for us personally, you know, like we need actually labor, in, labor who for small-scale farming or human-scale farming. So I don't know if there is more supply of this, uh, say Greta Thunberg kind of uh, young people who would like to do small-scale farming. Uh, I know there's a Hayes Farm where I also learned small scale farming. If people from Hayes Farm are starting to help us and having worked with us as an internship, uh, I mean, uh, not just planting, not just working on the soil, but also how to market it, how to create an organization together. I think that uh, there'll be a lot, uh, lot of help, you know, to, to grow this uh, movement, I would say. Yeah. I, I think just want to interject. I think that the idea of the online marketing is awesome and there's great potential. I just think as soon as we start talking food producers, especially small and medium scale food producers, it's really like we probably could have done great online. But the problem is we have to grow the food. We have the same amount of paperwork requirements that a company of a thousand people has to fill out. So at night, After my wife is done working, getting the employees to do their work, she does the paperwork just in order to have the right to have employees in the first place. And then so the amount of work that has to be done and then on top of that, on top of preparing for the market, communicating with customers, then you have to find a way to try and sell your product online. And the amount of pressure that puts on a, on a small business is just, it just makes it impossible. So you decide which one am I going to do? And we realize that time-wise, um, online marketing takes up too much time. And, um, and you know, like trying to like, it's, it's basically what it is, is there's this huge amount of paperwork and, re and requirements that are put on a small business. And the thing is, that's great if you can assign someone or if you have an accountant to manage all that. But what a lot of small farms are noticing is they really have to cut off key marketing opportunities in order to just actually grow the food in the first place. So that's an important thing to factor in is online marketing is a great opportunity, but resources for our small, like our new producers, you have to really be gifted in online marketing and social media and stuff. And some people can do it and it's great, 
But I would say if we expected average people to do that, we're probably asking too much of a producer. Whew, I'm happy you interjected. Thank you, Erin, for pointing that out. This is a really, really important one. Jill, I see you've unmuted. Yeah, yeah. I, I have as well. Just um, our department has supported uh, a lot of farms and CSA programs as well as farmers markets uh, in um, building new e-commerce sites. And just a question for Aaron and Data, like if it was a farmer's market that had the e-commerce site and that was selling your goods, would that be something that would be more manageable? Because I understand that, you know, having your own resource might be uh, a bit harder, but if somebody else was managing it, that program for you and you were just participating, would that be a stronger way for you? And by the way, thank you for sharing all the information about your, your initiatives. I really appreciate it and honored to be on the panel with you. Yep. Thank you. Yeah, so I, I, I agree with you. That is actually a good solution. So if uh, there is a farmer's market uh, website that uh, take uh, produce from local producer, I think that's a good solution. Yeah. Si je peux inter... Oh, vas-y, Aaron. Okay, but moi, moi, je voulais, je vais être vite. Je vais vite dire... Ça serait vraiment super. Le problème qu'on qu run into, puis que je connais, c'est que le problème, c'est que c'est quelqu'un d'autre qui gère le marché. So, le gérant du marché n'est pas nécessairement un fermier. Donc, la communication entre les deux, dans notre cas, est très dure. Peut-être dans d'autres, on peut surmonter cet obstacle, mais c'est un vrai obstacle parce que de con, comme, that's it. On a essayé de, de monter une initiative ou un projet un peu semblable à ça avec les marchés des fermiers, surtout à, à la municipalité de Beresford dans notre région. Puis le problème qui a ressorti pour nos fermiers, c'était que euh, les aliments doivent être commandés, achetés et payés à l'avance. Mais il n'y a pas de garantie que les fermiers vont pouvoir fournir ces aliments-là. Un, là, parce que, tu sais, on, on se comprend qu'il faut que ça sorte de la terre. Puis là, il y, a, il y avait toute la, la gestion au niveau de d'inventaire de, 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 de ce qu'ils avaient de disponible. Puis là, par la suite, c'est qu'il y, y a quand même des frais à quelque part parce que il, il faut que ça soit Le paiement doit être accepté par quelqu'un, que ce soit, euh, euh, mettons, euh, virement bancaire ou par carte de crédit. Fait que c'est qui qui assume ces frais-là? Ça retourne toujours aux fermiers parce que, mettons, la municipalité, c'est eux qui gèrent ça, le marché des fermiers qui gèrent ça. Ils ne peuvent pas prendre ces frais-là. Il y a aussi tous les frais reliés à avoir quelqu'un qui gère un site web, qui gère un Facebook. Puis trois quarts du temps, c'est des marchés-là, c'est soit des bénévoles ou ils ont quelqu'un qui est payé quatre heures, semaine à la pige. C'est pas comme les side gigs à Aaron, là. Tu sais, qui font ça. Fait on est... Euh, on n'a pas nécessairement les ressources à nulle part. C'est pour ça que nous autres, on se dit dans nos projets communautaires, on se partage l'information l'un à l'autre. Fait que non, on ne vend pas les produits des marchés des fermiers ou des, 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 des boîtes ou whatever en ligne, mais on, on fait la publicité de ces choses-là. Puis on se dit qu'à ce moment-là, ben au moins, on aide de cette façon-là. Mais c'est très complexe l'idée de vendre en ligne pour des petits fermiers. Il y a aussi que, euh, je me rappelle, quand j'ai commencé avec ma carrière, j'ai euh, une, une, une patronne qui m'a dit, si tu commences à le faire, il faut que tu continues à le faire. Fait que même si ça a l'air petit tout de suite, ça va venir gros puis ça va rester. Fait que assure-toi que plus tard, que tu vas continuer, comme qu'ils nous ont dit là, euh, tantôt, les madames, euh, il faut que tu t'assures que les décisions que tu prennes, là, qui sont bonnes pour cette génération-là, si tu commences à faire quelque chose dans un projet, assure-toi qu'il est bon pour les sept prochaines étapes de ton projet. It just goes to show these things are, are complex. There is not just, hey, here's a solution. There are so many things behind it. And that's where, you know, when we become disconnected from our food systems, then, you know, here I am saying, oh, well, we can put it all online. It, it's, we've got to really crack open What are all of these pieces? And I, I would like to ask a question posed by Jill in the chat box. She's interested to hear how both government food systems workers and land workers, farm workers, food systems entrepreneurs, how do we, how do we 
create the conditions to better have this flow of information because what a wonderful way right here right now that Jill can be you know from her lens and that we have producers um, that can share back and forth but what are the ways that we can um, create the conditions for that more regularly how do we work better together I find what's really interesting is um, I really feel like um, Mr. of Agriculture, DAF, has really stepped up to the plate when it comes to food, like to food issues on the ground. So like as a producer, the service, like someone that'll come and do soil tests, that there is the people on the ground are awesome. I mean, as far as the kind of support that they give us is great. The problem is it's a systemic problem. So it's, we can't change the system. So you have great resources, great people on the ground, but sadly their boss's hands are tied and the system does not, I'm just gonna say it straight out. The system does not, is not designed to help a small farmer. It's not designed to help someone that has limited um, finances to access fresh, healthy food. It's just not made that way. Our grocery stores aren't set up that way. Our supply chain is not set up that way. All these things that a lot of people say, and they're right, but it would have been hard. A lot of people say COVID was our chance to change, make some systemic change to meet these weak spots in our food system. But the reality is we haven't. Everyone's stepped up, like, you know, DAF has stepped up, communities have stepped up, solutions have come forward. But the, the system that we work for, and that's one reason why I didn't mention, but all the farmers that got the initiatives together that we're working with, work with the National Farmers Union. And this is a shameless plug, but the National Farmers Union is one of the two lobby groups that is seriously fighting for systems change, for better food access, for better um, environments, for workers, for farmers. So, and it's not just for farmers. So I really say, if you wanna be part of an organization in a group or contribute or hear about what's happening on that front, the National Farmers Union, I think of all the organizations, they're the ones that are, that are the feistiest. And this is a time that we need to fight the system. Oh, I see it. <laughs> break the roof. Thanks, Aaron. That's great. Uh, yeah, and the system is uh, built this way, right? So Jill, over to you. Yeah, I just wanted to say that we have identified and, and definitely heard the voices. And, and I'm going to thank Food for All as well for convening these tables during the pandemic, because I think it was a really great opportunity um, to convene these types of discussions um, and really helped bring some of these gaps and problems to the forefront. It was. Uh, and, and we heard you um, from the department. And um, I can even say I'm a part of um, province uh, a territorial uh, table um, as well. The federal government joins from time to time to talk about some of these things. And the, the problem of a lot of the support systems uh, being built to support the, the larger food producing um, companies has been brought to the forefront that there is a gap with the small and mid-sized farmers in you know providing the training that's necessary and some of the supportive tools um, and I can tell you that uh, the conversation is active and that we are looking at um, building some of those tools and um, at DAF we definitely are talking with our business growth team they're here uh, to help support you in any way uh, we're actually trying to pr to dedicate a page to them because they are the the front line staff here at our department to to work directly with the the food producers um, and they're we're we're trying to to create a dedicated page on the GMB website um, that is going to have all of their names, where they're from, where they are, their contact details, so that we can kind of shorten the pathway towards getting that direct information from our department. Uh, so we're definitely 
working hard to try and improve things. And uh, I think you all know that it's not always easy as government to move fast, but uh, definitely some really progressive things are coming down the tube. And I'm really, um, and it's as a result of a lot of these types of conversations. So thank you for bringing them forward. Really appreciate it. Thanks, Jill. And I guess, you know, I'm going to go to Data next. Um, but Data, you've been talking about decolonizing the way that we work and think and run. And so like these are so many of, of the issues we face are, are, you know, due to colonial structures. And so I, I don't know if that's what you're going to say, but these things move slow. They didn't start this way overnight. And so I'm happy to hear that we like inch forward a little bit, but bringing it up is important. Data, over to you. Thank you. I was actually going to uh, kind of address a little bit how to, uh, in the future, we can collaborate more between uh, government and the producers. I think uh, uh, community is is the key here in this case. Like you mentioned about website matters. Okay, website is good, and we can have farmers market doing website or uh, Chris mentioned or producer co-op website, which is cool too. But what's important is. Uh, how does it actually relates to the community? Does it actually empowers community? Because at the end, it's about people. You know, this food production system is about nature, but also about people. And just the website itself doesn't solve anything if the people are not actually consuming local produce. And one of the things, you know, as a kind of like uh, amateur, amateur or market gardener, we look at uh, you know, Fortier for the JMF. Uh, he has Montreal as a market that can absorb his produce. Here, I think uh, we still have a long way to go to educate the, the people how to have a, create a market that produces that. And that's why I said roadside stalls, you know, bringing the produce to these people itself, they could see, oh, the carrots are actually better if it's organic, for example. It's, it's, I think it's, it's, a, it's a potential, you know, and then we can do that by organizing maybe people uptown into a community garden where they actually get a little bit of taste of the food and then you know, the organic producer can supply more with the stall or shops funded by the government or whatever. In third world, it was actually funded with the, by the government. And then, uh, yeah, and then the food production system could, could improve, improve that way for the local producer. Thank you. Thanks, Data. So I'm looking at time, we're at 2.15. Here's what we're gonna do because the plan was we're opening up breakout rooms so that we can just allow folks to, to do, um, an open networking after we're through. Um, I will suggest that we stay in this room, that we don't go anywhere um, for that to happen. And so I'm going to give a word to Jen because I want you to be able to answer that question. Then I want you to, to tell us in, I don't know, five words or less, what you want to get loud about, because that's, yeah, I know, I'm really sorry. <laughs> um, that's what we're talking about. And so um, let's, let's shorten up that final word. We'll do one more go around, because this is what we're, we want to know. What do we need to get loud about? What are we getting loud about going forward? So Jen, you're, I'm sorry, you're going to be, You're being pushed into this task. Moi, toi. Euh, moi j'aimerais euh, vous remercier, mais j'aimerais vraiment nourrir la discussion sur euh, l'accessibilité puis euh, le, la disponibilité des aliments euh, locaux. Merci. Data, five words or less. Can you do it? What do you want to get loud about? <laughs> you may have already said it. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's, uh, I think uh, maybe a, a little bit, uh, I already mentioned about community. I mean, if the government could be more involved in uh, helping or supporting community initiatives. I personally think uh, funding is not, is not uh, the solution. You know, it's more into that, more like uh, uh, what, what I actually presented that, that uh, Uh, the balance between, you know, community use, private use, and that, that sort of things. Mm -hmm. And uh, also in this uh, matters also about, about the environment too. So if uh, we see Canada is land of abundance, abundance of, I come from Java where there's not many land, and here mm -hmm. land is everywhere. And, uh, you know, if it can be put to use, it can create jobs, I think, uh, and it can produce uh, quality food for the food population, I think that will... Uh, be wonderful. Thanks. Mm. 
All right, thanks, Data. And so, Aaron and Jill, you get the last two words. Then I'll ask that the um, breakout rooms get open, um, and we'll say a quick word of farewell. But uh, everyone will be able to self-select a breakout room and continue conversations, chat with one another if they wish, or head off for the day and go get a nap or whatever whatever it is you need. So, Aaron, Jill, I don't know who's going to unmute first here. Five words or less. Uh, what are we getting loud about? I'm a broken record. Systems change. Systems change. Okay. Systems I've been saying change. it for years. <laughs> and Jill. There's so much. So five words or less. Uh, grow by feed New Brunswick. Well, Let's well work done. together to do that. <laughs> <laughs> thanks, Jill. And thanks, thanks so much. to all of our participants. Merci beaucoup, beaucoup pour votre participation, pour votre engagement et votre énergie. Wow. On a vraiment nourri la discussion. Um, we've really talked about so many things and gotten loud about so many things. And so from the entire team over here at Food for All, thank you. Um, we appreciate your time and energy. And uh, we will open up our breakout rooms. And again, uh, everyone in the room should be able to self-select. If you would like to continue the conversation, you can feel free to pop into a breakout room or not. We'll open those up. Can I ask someone, are they open? They're open now. And so you'll see the breakout room button at the bottom of your screen. You can choose to go into a room. We have five of them. And so pop in or pop out. But thank you for coming to get loud with us. We couldn't, we couldn't do it without you. So very much appreciated. Merci beaucoup, merci beaucoup. Thanks everyone. Thanks everyone. Thanks everyone. Oh, Thanks, everyone. Merci.